we still have a minute and 23 seconds. Hello, my name is John Mad Dog Hall, and I'm the president of Linux International. I'm also the president of a project which I've been working on for seven years called Project Kawa. For those of you who don't know me, uh oh, my little clicker isn't working. Let me try and see why it's not working. Ah. For those of you who don't know me, my education was in a combination of commerce and engineering, electrical engineering, and then later on I got a master's in computer science. When I studied in undergraduate theory, in undergraduate, there was no computer science degree. People were not professional programmers. They were physicists, electrical engineers, chemists, and they needed the computer to do their work, but they really didn't program for a living. In fact, I had a professor who told me, John, you will never be able to make a living as a professional programmer, and I'm still trying to find out if he was right. I've done a lot of jobs in the computer industry. I've been a programmer and a systems administrator, and I've been a product manager and a marketing technical marketing manager, and I've written in a wide variety of different programming languages. In May of 1994, I met Linus Torvalds, and I saw Linux for the first time. And I said, this is an operating system that has commercial value. It's not just a hobbyist operating system. It's just not for a bunch of technical geeks to play with. This has real commercial value. And so I got him an alpha processor so he could take Linux and make it from a 32-bit a system to a 64-bit system. Now, what does that mean? With 32 bits, you can access four billion bytes of data at one time. With 64 bits, you can access four billion times four billion bytes of data. That's enough data to fill up a one gigabyte disk drive every second of the day, day in, day out, for the next 5,386 years. Or enough data to store 128 bytes of data for every square millimeter of the surface of the Earth and all the oceans. But the Alpha was also a RISC processor, a reduced instruction set processor. And the Intel chips are typically complicated instruction set, which means that for every instruction which you execute in the Intel instruction set, there are many tiny little instructions being executed further down below. You, know, you don't really know what they're doing. It's just that it comes up with a result. It's kind of like calling a subroutine in a library or a function. 
you don't know how that function is doing it. It's just a return certain value to you. But a risk processor is different. For every machine cycle, it executes one machine language instruction. And so you're fairly sure what you're getting back when you execute that instruction. I also started a bunch of different things in Linux International. I started the, to protect the Linux trademark for people to use it. I helped to start the Linux Professional Institute, which gives out certifications for systems administrators. And I helped to start the Linux Standard Base Project, which continues today, that helps to define a binary standard for applications to be distributed on top of Linux. And for the last 20 years, I've been going around promoting Linux worldwide. Now recently, I became involved with a company called Linero. I work for them as a consultant. For those of you who have cell phones, and in this room, I imagine some of you have two or three, most of them have an ARM processor inside. Because ARM is a risk instruction set computer that uses a very, very small amount of power. And ARM is also used in a lot of embedded devices, such as your home routers and a variety of other things. But ARM, the corporation, does not produce these chips. They only give the design, the architecture. Other companies like Samsung, Hitachi, Motor, uh, not Motorola, but Texas Instruments, they take that design and make the chip, whether it be the CPU or a GPU chip, or perhaps combining them together to make a whole system on a chip. And what this does is allow these companies to compete with each other in the best overall design, the best price, the best channels. It allows these companies, which are in different countries, to be able to manufacture these chips in an open environment. Now, ARM licenses these out to help to support the company. And they also have these summit companies who want to port GNU Linux to them. And they were doing this, and all of these companies were kind of interfering with each other. All of them were doing the same work. All of them were contributing the code back to the kernel. And it created kind of a mess inside the Linux kernel. So a friend of mine who worked at ARM decided to form an association called Linero. And this uses a couple of engineers from each one of the companies and some money to help form a team of people to make sure that GNU Linux works well on the ARM processor for all of the companies. A very large collaborative effort. Now, I've been in the computer industry this year for 45 years. For some of you, that's longer than your parents have been alive. I've been programming. And every year, I hear people say, CPUs are really fast. One time, I heard a person say, I swear I heard a person say, CPUs for the desktop are fast enough. Really? My CPU has never been fast enough. My CPU will never be fast enough until I can talk to it and have it understand me just the way that you can understand me, even without an interpreter. I also hear in some universities that Java is the only language you'll ever need. Java is portable. Java can do everything. Of course, I've heard that of many different languages. But the day that Larry Allison rewrites the Oracle database server in Java, I might believe. 
I also heard nobody codes in assembler language anymore. We don't need to teach assembly language in universities. Well, if you don't know assembly language or machine language, how can you write compilers? If you don't know the architecture of the machine, how can you write an operating system? Again, when somebody writes an operating system in Java, let me know. <laughs> and I've also heard that virtual machines make knowing anything about the computer architecture obsolete because the programs run in the virtual machine. I think these people are confused between a virtual machine and an emulator. Because in most virtual machines I know of, the actual code runs on the hardware and only when you execute certain particular instructions does the virtual machine take over. So the hardware architecture is still extremely important. Now, as I said, I've been programming for 45 years. I've gotten to the point in my life where I only like what I call real problems. People say, oh, Mad Dog, look at this game. Aren't you impressed? No. <laughs> I say, oh, I just wrote this really cool little widget over here. Isn't it wonderful? No. Nah. No. I'm impressed when you say to me, Mad Dog, it's petabytes of data. So you have gigabytes, terabytes, petabytes. I'm impressed if it's more than petabytes of data. I'm impressed when it's real, real time. My nuclear power plant is melting. Computers, stop it. That's real time. Because if you're not fast enough, then the nuclear power plant melts and there's nothing you can do about it. I could just imagine if the controls of Chernobyl were written in Java. Nuclear power plant starting to blow up? Oh, I have to do garbage collection. Let's see, bike comes over here, bike comes over there. Oh, what were you asking me to do again? Where are you? <laughs> I don't, I, I, I am fairly good friends with Linus Torvalds. I've, I'm the godfather of his children. But I never talk to Linus about things inside of the Linux kernel. I feel that he's got enough people to help him do that. Doesn't need me. But one day I called him up in the early days of the Linux kernel. I said, Linus, we can sell a lot more Linux systems if you can make the kernel more real-time. He says, what do you mean by that? The kernel is real-time. I said, Linus, how, I don't understand. How can you say that? He says, well, when I'm playing Quake and the monster has a gun in its hand, I hit the key on the keyboard and I kill the monster. That's real-time. I said, Linus, put a real gun in the monster's hand and see if you feel the same way. He thought about it for a couple seconds. Says, I understand what you mean. <laughs> and the next version of Linux, the real time was much improved. So I want real time. And I want to be able to do also time sharing with the same system. It's possible. Cell phone apps. You know, it used to be that performance was measured by how fast your mainframe computer could process that petabyte of data plugged into your power plant and your 20-ton air conditioner with your three-phase power. Yes! But today, performance is measured by my battery just died. Why can't my phone last a whole day? I'm just playing music, watching videos, 
surfing the net, all of this with a battery inside that's smaller than a hearing aid. <laughs> so today, performance is measured in saving battery life, saving the environment. Brazil is very gracious, been supplied with hydroelectric plants like Itaipu. Supplies 25% of the power of Brazil. But just like we like to save battery life for cell phones, we want to save electricity with the server farms that we have. And if we have 10,000 servers, and we can save 100 watts on each one of those servers by writing our software better, then we can save a lot of energy. Enough energy to keep several hundred homes fueled. We save energy not only in the amount of computers that we need to do the work, but we save energy in the amount of cooling and air conditioning we need to keep the computers cool. Brazil is an interesting country because it tends to go north and south and tends to surround the equator. And I go to some offices and I see all the air conditioners up on the wall and then I see all the space heaters down on people's desks or underneath the floor. They call them computers, but they're really space heaters because they use 350 to 500 watts of electrical power to do desk editing and surfing the web. Sometimes they use a thousand watts of power to play some game. This is crazy. I cook food with a thousand watts of power. So saving the environment and getting rid of this concept that every three years we throw away our computers because they're not fast enough. We need to do things better. And the new things that are coming out are things that have been around for a while, but we have not been able to afford them. Field programmable gate arrays are now emerging so inexpensive that we can start to think about using them for everything, lots of different things. And this will improve the performance of our computer programs tens of times, hundreds of times, if we know how to use them, if we know how to program them. Digital signal processing chips, also very good at saving lots of CPU, lots of time. Now, when I started programming in 1969, my first language was Fortran. Spelled in all capital letters, thank you. Like any decent language should be. It wasn't Fortran 2, or Fortran 4, or Fortran 77, or high performance Fortran, or any of the other many Fortrans that have come out. It was Fortran. But my second language was assembler for the PDP-8. 4,000, oh dear, 4,000 12-bit words in the system. And the machine was so simple that it couldn't subtract. It could only add. So if you wanted to subtract two numbers, you had to take the uh, inverse of the subtrahend and add it to the menu end. I read this, I learned this from reading a book and lots of practice. And what I learned was to be able to write really great code, you needed to understand the machine language and the assembly language that went with it. You could write good code without doing that, but you had to know it to write really great code. Now, I didn't always write in assembly language. The first seven years of my life, I wrote in assembly language. 
And I do not advocate, I do not say to you that you should be writing in assembly language. Actually, the opposite. But what you should be aware of is what happens when you write in your high-level language, how the compiler or the interpreter is using that down at the machine level. It should be in your mind. So right out of college, right out of university, I was working for a very large company, and we used a lot of COBOL in the company. And despite what people think of COBOL, it's actually a very efficient language for what it's meant for. But every once in a while, one of the COBOL programmers would come to me and say, Mad Dog, I can't figure out what's wrong with my program. I've looked at it, looked at it, looked at it. I can't see what's wrong. So I would look at the code. I couldn't see what's wrong either. And I said, I think the compiler is making a mistake. <gasps> the compiler make a mistake? I said, yes. The compiler is a program written by a programmer just like you. And just like you, they may have come in drunk at the end of the night of drinking, have a hangover, their head pounding, and they wrote that line of code in the COBOL compiler, and it was wrong. <laughs> and it's generating a wrong answer. So we would compile the program, and we would look at the assembly language, and there it was. But that COBOL compiler could have looked at their source code until the cows come home and not realized what the problem was. Another time, I was working on a very large program on an IBM mainframe, and the program, when it ran, not only ran slowly, but every other program on that machine ran slowly at the same time. In fact, every program on every machine even remotely connected to that machine ran slowly. So my management said to me, can you find out what's wrong? I looked at the program, I profiled the code to see where it was spending its time, and I found out that one machine language instruction was taking up 99% of the time of the program. So all of the rest of the instructions were only taking up 1%. I said, what is that instruction? It is read the clock. Read the clock. Why is that taking up so much time? It turns out in that architecture, read the clock was used to set up a lock inside of the kernel. And in order for that lock to be set up, all of the I.O. had to come to a stop. All of the cache and the CPU had to be flushed out to memory. Every single one of the CPUs that are connected to it had to come to a complete halt. And then one CPU read the clock. And I went to the programmer, I said, why did you use that instruction? He said, I was trying to find out what day it was. I said, couldn't you have done that one time at the beginning of your program instead of 100,000 times during the course of it? Do it one time and store it in a variable. Oh yeah, I guess I could, couldn't I? <laughs> And the next time that program ran, it went so fast that the operators thought it had, had abended, it had come to an abominable termination. After we finished the port to the alpha, a friend of mine used the alpha with Linux 
to multiply two very large arrays. If you do it the way that most people do matrix algebra, it takes a very long time. Because with a second array, every time you pick up a variable, you miss the cache of the CPU and have to go all the way out to memory. But if you take the second array and invert it, do your multiplication and invert the answer, then it will go 40 times faster. If you know the architecture of the machine, you can figure out why it's taking so long. One last example. I was teaching at a small two-year college and this person came in and wrote a program for the administration. They were going to sort 1,206 records of 32 bytes apiece. It took the machine 10 and one half hours to sort the 1,206 32 byte records. I looked at his program. If it was possible to do anything wrong, he did it. First of all, and the, the most horrible thing, he used a bubble sort. Secondly, he never tested to see if everything was already sorted. Third, he never realized that every time he went through the bubble sort, there was always a, the, the next record was in place, so he didn't have to go so far the next time. To sort the 1,206 records, he did 32 million comparisons and 700,000 accesses to the disk. I could have I sorted those numbers faster by punching them on the cards, throwing them up in the air, and picking them up off the floor. <laughs> so I rewrote the program. And then on the same machine with the same operating system, it took less than three minutes, from ten and a half hours to less than three minutes. Today, there's a lot of universities that are teaching products like Microsoft Office. Now, I have no real objection to a university teaching business students, as an example, how to use an Office product to make your business better, with Microsoft Office as an example, and Open Office as an example, and K Office as an example, and you also teach the students how to pick the best Office product for their use. That might be worthwhile. There are universities that teach Java and what we call information technology instead of teaching assembly language and operating systems. And they're using a lot of virtual machines, which isn't necessarily bad, but the students also need to be able to use real iron. High school students will get a computer, never open it up, go down, get a game at the store or at their local software piracy shop, put it on the computer, and play the game. Then they'll write some HTML for a website, and they figure they're a programmer. And that has created a situation where most high school think students think of the computer like this, that the computer is their friend. I know that's not true. The computer hates everybody equally. <laughs> and in reality, the computer looks like that. Okay? And it's purposely blurred so you can't read anything. And that's what students have to know. And so this is why a few months ago, or about a couple years ago, some professors at the University of Cambridge created the Raspberry Pi because they realized the students coming into their university from high school knew less than the students of 20 years ago that had the Amiga, 
the Commodore, would have to type in programs from magazines or that they found on bulletin boards on the internet. And every once in a while they would have a syntax error. What does that mean? How do I fix that? A friend of mine recently was trying to hire a programmer, a senior programmer. He said to the senior programmer, how much do you know about cache memory of a computer? The programmer said to him, I think it makes the computer run faster somehow. And he didn't get the job. So here's the Raspberry Pi. In the United States and in Western Europe, it sells for 35 US dollars. I realize that here in Brazil, it's a little bit more. But it still gives a lot of great hardware at a very low amount of power for a university or for a high school student. Now notice I said high school student. That seems strange. Why not a university student? Because there's a whole bunch of additional little computers of various price ranges that have what I think are more interesting. Remember, I'm the one who thinks that petabytes of data are interesting. I'm the one who thinks that real-time programming of nuclear power plants is interesting, okay? These are more interesting than the Raspberry Pi. Like this one, the Odroid U3, which has two CPUs on it. One that runs it slower with four cores and less power. One that runs faster with more cores, four cores, and more power. It's more interesting to program those. The Galileo from Intel, that you, it is compatible with shields from the Arduino. You can stick the Arduino shield on there, but it has a full 32-bit computer and can run a full version of GNU Linux at the same time. So you can use the Arduino to do your real-time programming, and you can use your Galileo to do your soft real-time and development work. These are kind of interesting, but there's another one. This is called the Parallel Board. And the Parallel Board has a system on a chip with two, uh, two core ARM processor and a field programmable gate array and some digital signal processing chips. And it has another CPU that has either 16 or 64 cores on it that you can program it in parallel. This is basically a supercomputer on a board that uses less than five watts of power and costs less than a hundred dollars. This is a type of computer that I would expect that a university student would want to learn how to program. It has a wide variety of different types of hardware for you to become experienced with, not just a single core CPU of the Raspberry Pi. And believe me, I know the Raspberry Pi people. I love what they've done. But if you're going to be a computer scientist, you need to do something like this. So I've been working with GNU Linux actually the GNU project since 1984. And I've been working with GNU Linux for the last 20 years. Now, during that time, memories have become larger. Memories no longer selling at $128 a megabyte. is selling at $10 a gigabyte. CPUs have become much faster. In 1984, CPUs were a million instructions a second not a billion instructions a second. And the CPUs are multi-core, not single core. Algorithms have changed. We've, we've, we've figured out new algorithms for coming in. And optimizations in the compilers have gotten better. The GNU compilers used to be 30% slower in, gener in generated code than a commercial compiler. Today, it's very hard to find 
a commercial proprietary compiler that generates code better than the GNU compilers. The need, therefore, for assembly language has decreased. In fact, in writing an assembly language, unless you're extremely good, you're going to do worse than the compiler. So ARM has recently developed a 64-bit chip, a 64-bit design. And they looked at the code in GNU Linux, and they found out that there are 1,000 400 programs that have assembly language in them. That means that somebody is going to have to take that modules and convert that assembly language to ARM64. And the ARM people came to me and said, Mad Dog, you did this once with Alpha. Could you help us do it again with ARM64? So we started to look at this code, and we realized that a lot of this code had a very special class of code. You know, you have different classes of code. This, cla this code's class is crufty. Crufty, scuzzy, horrible code <laughs> written a long time ago. The people who wrote it did the best they could at the time. But if you looked at it today, it's crufty. Sometimes they looked at the assembly language of one processor and said, I will find a similar assembly language instruction of the new one and just use that. That is not the way you should be writing assembly language. Sometimes they wrote some upper level code. So in case the assembly language the language for the processor that you're using was not there, that the compiler would take over. But the assembly language that was there is still being executed. Big mistake. So we looked at all of this and we said, no, what we really need is not a porting event. What we need is an optimization event to go through and look at all this old crufty code and rip out the crufty parts and make it better. So we formed a contest where we want all 1400 modules, yes, to be ported to ARM64. And for that we will reward people with certain prizes and things like that. But if you increase the performance of these by a certain amount, by writing new code, using a new algorithm, then there's another portion of the contest that you can win. And all of the rules and the different things you can win are on the contest site. Now, when we think of performance, just like I started off, it's not always just about speed. There's a percentage of performance improvement you've gotten. But remember, your ARM is used a lot for embedded systems. And so you can't just use a lot of memory and speed up your program that way. You have to be careful. You also have to utilize cache of the processors you're going with. And different processors have different types of cache. You have to have a good algorithm replacement. In certain cases, we think the compiler should be doing the work completely. And so maybe a new intrinsic for the compiler should be designed. And if you see a performance improvement that the compiler could use, that would be great too. That helps everybody. And there may be more categories. These are some of the prizes just for entering the contest, just for having one program ported, which could be just as easy as trying to compile the program and see if the compiler works. You get a wonderful Linero golf shirt. You get some more stuff I'll cut to in a moment. If you do a number of these, 
we may give you a very nice ARM development system. If you port something and we put you into a pool and you win the drawing of the pool, you'll get to go to a connect meeting. We have these meetings twice a year, sometimes in the United States, sometimes in Asia. The last one was in Macau, which you may be aware of is a Portuguese-speaking country. And uh, it's a very nice meeting. We have engineers come from all over the world to give talks on the work that they're doing. You get to meet these engineers, and you would get to present to them the work that you have done. So, like I said, we have the meetings sometimes in the United States, sometimes in Asia. You'd have a choice of which one you wanted to. All expenses paid, hotel, airfare, and travel to connect. But there are side effects. Because, because you've done this work, if you're a university student or not, you get to put this into your resume. You get to point to the performance work that you've done. You get to learn a very interesting assembly language. You learn to do code analysis techniques where you write in your high-level code and you say, compiler, generate the assembly language. Now, if the compiler generates this much assembly language, you probably figure you've done something wrong. So you change your upper-level code and you find out it's generated this much assembly language. That's good. You change your code again, you find out it's generated that much assembly language. Even better. And so you can see, almost literally by eye, how fast your code is going to execute because this is a risk processor. More or less every instruction takes one machine language or one, one clock cycle. You can put this into a portfolio to show to prospective employers. And I'm going around to different universities asking the universities to use some of these optimization techniques in a course in optimization. It opens up some research into new optimization techniques. I just came back from Rio de Janeiro where I was speaking to the person who had developed the Lua language. And Lua is an embedded system scripting language that's extremely fast. I want him to get interested in this contest to make Lua even faster on the 64-bit arm. We're looking for mentors. If you're a college professor and you're interested in this type of work, we're looking for mentors who could mentor students and help them, and also engineers who are interested in this. This is not just about college students. Anybody can join except Linero employees. Uh, if you do the assembly language port, don't try for any optimization, but just 64-bit port, we will ask you to put in certain pieces of information to let us know what you did. If you said, hey, I just compiled it and it worked, that's fine. But did you also test it? We'd like to see the test results. If you're doing performance, there's a certain additional pieces of information we would like. And to help you write this up and perhaps publish this in a magazine, is another goal of the contest. Here are some resources. I remember the first time I ever looked at the GNU compiler, I think it had maybe five options on it. Slow, slower, and slowest. But now you look at it, and it's got lots of options, and it really is a great compiler. And if you haven't looked at those options in a long time, you should. So, books that have been written on a GCC compiler and how to make it work and how to have it generate good code are useful. Books on debugging are useful. Valgrind, which is a very nice system for debugging and profiling code. If you haven't seen it, you should. The ARM assembly language book is very good. It's available online from Lula. And this is the time frame for the contest. We have finished the formalized design. We're putting the website together now. 
Each one of you can go to the website, log in, create an account, log in, and choose a module to work on. If you then finish the module, finish the port, you can log back in and say, I finished. And then we'll send you your shirt and enter you in the drawing prize. If you stop for like three weeks or a month, you may get a gentle reminder saying, hi, are you still working on this? And that's okay if you, you got busy or it was harder than you thought or something, but we'd like to hand over the module to somebody else to work on. And we're going to publish all of the rules and everything by the end of June. And by the end of 2014, we'll have the initial prizes and drawings for the Connect meetings. But we anticipate that this contest will go on basically forever. Because even after everything is ported to ARM64, there's always need for improvement and optimization of code. We're also looking for universities to be a home to some of this information. If you, wanna, if you have a university and you'd like to give a course in optimization, then we'd be happy to share the information with you and you know, keep you abreast of new things that are coming out so that you can teach your students how to do this. So with that, there's my email address. If you have any questions or comments, feel free to send them to me. That is going to be the URL for the site when we get it finished in a week or two. And you can go there and learn about the performance contest and enter it. And even if you don't enter the contest, we're going to have forums that you can look at to learn about optimization techniques and be worthwhile. So thank you very much for coming. If you have any questions, I have my little translator thing here, and you have to use the microphone so translators can hear you. If you don't have any questions, then, as I said, just send me some email. Google Translate is my friend. Thank you very much.